Welcome to Someone's Good Books, the show that shines a light on really good books released during a challenging time. I'm your host, Joel A. Sutherland, author of the best-selling Haunted Canada series, and the only person left on the planet who wouldn't know what to do with a jar of yeast even if he was lucky enough to find one. My guest today is Wesley King, the New York Times best-selling author of 11 novels, including the Wizard series, O.C. Daniel, the Vindigo series, and A World Below. His books have been optioned for film and television and translated for release worldwide. Besides writing, he is working on a circumnavigation on a 1967 sailboat. He lives in Nova Scotia. Welcome. But crawl back on and and promise to wear a vest and, and a harness always uh, after that. But uh, yeah, I very nearly perished in the Mediterranean, uh, which would have been a cool story. I mean, that's a you know famous passage there to Pantelleria, but you know I'd rather write it. So yeah, <laughs> I'll say better to write about those sort of things. That's. When kids always ask me if I've ever seen a ghost, I say, no, 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 I'm, I'm happy to write about them. I'd rather not see them. And that's not even nearly as serious as what you went through. Unbelievable. Well, thanks so much for starting us off on that footing. Right, if yeah. anyone uh, watching, yeah, absolutely. If anyone watching the video uh, wants to say hello or has any questions for Wesley, by all means, please post them in the chat and we'll try and get to them if we have time. So Wes, if you're all set, shall we get started? Let's do it. Awesome. And it's time to get into somebody's good books. Here we go. The first question for you, Wes. The Wizard series, season one, was released on March 31st, 2020 by Granity Studios. In the spirit of the show, tell us what makes it a good book. So what makes it a good book, um, I guess, is, is a number of things. Uh, it's, a, it's a really sort of Kobe-esque book. Of course, for those who don't know, I re, uh, co-wrote this book with Kobe Bryant. Um, you know, my late friend, Kobe Bryant, but who really put his heart and soul into this project. And, and this is like a really pure inspirational story of, of a kid, an underdog kid who, who puts the work in and sees the rewards that come from it. And it's a, it's a really good quarantine book, actually, because it's all about what he does by himself. It's, it's all about isolation, um, the kind of isolation that we do to ourselves day to day on a mental basis. Now, of course, the physical side matches all that. And we're probably a lot of us who do mentally isolate are now seeing this clash of worlds where we're also physically isolating. It can be a lot for people, and it, it can be a lot for kids right now, and for teens, and they're missing on these experiences. Um, so this is a good book for that, and um, really just proud to put out a story that's kind of uplifting at this time. It was maybe the right time for that, I think. Not all my stories are as uplifting as this one. <laughs> well, perfect. The world, the world definitely needs a bit more of that right now. It does. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that, uh, that obviously you wrote this before the pandemic was even on anyone's mind, yeah. obviously long before that, uh, it's kind of seems like it was almost meant to be. It was. And better than the, the manuscript I was writing before the pandemic hit was about a post-apocalyptic world of zombies that people were surviving on a boat. So that one was less fitting, really. That one I'm now sitting on like, no, this is terrible. Uh, so I like <laughs> the positive ones right now. I think they're a little better suited to this time. Right. <laughs> I'd have to agree with you. Although, you know, a good old fashioned zombie story still will uh, will appeal to me just about any time totally. under any circumstances. So send it to me. I'll read it at least. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Just <laughs> wanted to put that out there as an offer. One sale. Um, well, you didn't promise to buy it, but one read. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Fine. I'll send you an e-transfer. All right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got to ask, what's it like uh, having a book released now during a global pandemic? Yeah, it's, it's super weird because all the things that you think you're supposed to do when you publish a book are, are not happening. You know, you, you plan your bookstores, your school readings, you, you plan signings. Um, so all these things you can't do, of course. So on the actual promotional side, it's very strange. And I think, though, on the maybe the fundamental value of it, it's like, well, books are also extremely important right now. You know, I know for me, I'm reading more. I know a lot of people are reading more right now. Uh, because we have to, it's it's sort of the escapism. So there's like the, you know, this is a bittersweet thing again, uh, where you know the book is getting out there and it's being enjoyed, but you kind of feel a little bit useless as an author because you just have to sit at home and, and cross your fingers and hope that's happening. You can't really do anything except for you know Zoom chats and stuff. And this is, you know, it, it's like kind of like we're just talking into space, and then sometimes we are, sometimes we are. You don't know. Um, and I suppose that's you know all any authors know that's kind of always the case. No matter how much thought you put into promotions and marketing, there's always a bit of a roll of the dice to see what books take off and what don't. But uh, this is certainly a strange time to do it. 
but the good news, you know, the great thing, as you know, is to get the kids that send you letters and stuff now and they're reading and they're finding comfort in it. That's kind of a nice thing to, to add to this, you know, current environment that we're in. Yeah, it's a weird time. You know, it's, uh, you know, I'm sure you're the same like me. This I'd be um, really neck deep in school visits library visits right now. This is when the, you know, the festival of reading typically takes place and uh, so many other reading programs for kids with these live author events. And obviously that's not happening right now. So it is a little unusual. We, you mentioned that uh, it's a little like talking to space. I'll, I'll have you know that so far we have one thumbs up and one heart on this video. So two Ooh. people are watching. We're doing pretty good. We're doing pretty well. <laughs> please no thumbs downs <laughs> that's right no thumbs down no angry emojis yet so no crying either there's the little crying face and it, it hasn't been clicked on yet so that's that that's could have been cool. my mom and my dad though so far so. <laughs> <laughs> well thank you to your parents for tuning in yeah. i appreciate that <laughs> all right so uh to remind our viewers we're gonna do a little recap here the name of the book we've talked about so far is the wizard series book one it is a sequel. So yeah, Wesley, yeah, math phoned and wants to know, what's your beef? <laughs> so it's actually, it's season one, but the first book is called Training Camp. So it's, it's ahead of even the season. So, you know, it, it was supposed to go essentially Training Camp, season one, then playoffs, and then, you know, we're, we're following this. But I, in retrospect, calling book two season one, is a bit strange. <laughs> <laughs> so no beef with math, uh, just. Well, yes, beef with math as well. <laughs> uh, no, in hindsight, but unrelated. You can see the confusion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, season one is book two. However, it can be read without diving into the first one if you want. But you know, read both. That's that's the best way to do it. I would agree with that. I. Uh... I remember seeing uh, the, the first one, Training Camp, is a massive book, really thick. This one I haven't seen a physical copy yet since I haven't been. I'm a librarian. I haven't been in the library. Yeah, it's a, it's a quicker it's read. Yeah, maybe a little more accessible. Yeah, actually, I got Training Camp. I got both of them right, but so you can see, you know, right. fairly substantial. The reason being that, that Training Camp is five stories in one, which wasn't always the plan. And in some languages, it's not released that way. It's released as five books. Uh, wow. I, English people just got a big heaping tome of a book for so you know maybe we like that. I, you know, it no other country wanted it that, that way except for, except for North America. So <laughs> I don't know. Stronger readers, I guess, that can lift it. Who knows? I like yeah. it. We'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right, so I've got to ask a really serious question now. Um, what's your quarantine survival motto? Netflix and chill. Chill the beer or beards and hair, just let them grow. Ooh, I mean, a little bit of all, I guess. Uh, you know, That's definitely cool. all. Today, I took my hat off for the first time in weeks and was like, you know, dear God, I hope I still have hair because, you know, that's happening slowly now. And, and I did, thankfully. But, you know, generally, I've shaved today too, but generally it's beard, hat, um, you know, boat, beers. I'm living on the water. There's just sort of a whole rolling thing there. Uh, the, the good news, you know, for those of us who were already working at home, this is just an impetus to maybe do more work since you can't leave your home. Uh, so in some ways, this has actually been good in a writing sense. Um, but I'm definitely, I'm sure all of us are, are getting a, a little bit stir crazy at, at this point. It'd be nice to, you know, go see people again and things like that. I don't have any children. Um, I know you do. I know that presents a whole different set of challenges, having um, children all of a sudden they have to school and, and do things. and. You created, uh, you know, the Simpsons. This is the things that are happening, I guess, when you have a lot of time with your kids around. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta think of any way to entertain them, basically, because <laughs> right. the teachers aren't doing it. I mean, the teachers are doing it for us, obviously, by you know, running online virtual schools. But there's still so much time that we're at home with the kids. Thinking, what do we do now? So that's why, you know, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, we actually have a question uh, in the chat, and I'm afraid that uh, it might get buried. I might not see it, so I want to jump to it right now. Uh, Ray Fernandez says, most if not all of your books were written by just you. What was it like to co-author a book? Um, you know, and it was such a, what a way to start co-authoring a book, to, to get Kobe Bryant as, as your co-author. Yeah. 
Um, you know, it was it was so confusing in the beginning because I got this this sort of email that Kobe wanted to start writing a book, which made almost no sense at the time. This was back in you know 2016. I didn't even know Kobe liked books. Never mind wanted to write one. Right. Um, and so you go and you meet him, and you don't know exactly what to expect. But he was this really voracious reader and this like diehard storyteller. I mean, he had a giant picture on his wall of J.K. Rowling. He like idolized J.K. Rowling as this, this master of storytelling. This was a guy who was storytelling. So yeah, I it, love that so much. It, it was great. He it was actually the perfect way because you know he's he kind of wanted me to spread my wings and write a little bit, uh, but it was also like the hype man. You know, he was like having an editor that loves everything that you do, you know, when, which most of us who have editors know they don't love everything that you do. Uh, they don't love maybe half of the things that you do sometimes. depends on what's going on. Kobe <laughs> was a hype man to the core, you know. So he was an absolute dream uh, collaborator. And, and actually kind of sparked for me now. I like collaborating. I'm collaborating on a project right now with another author as well. Now I kind of see the light a little bit of how that can be this, this fun sort of teamwork thing when I always thought writing was a super solitary experience. You know, you're supposed to write your magnum opus mm -hmm. in you know, a small room. That's not necessarily how it has to be, as it turns out, which is good for your sanity, I think. Yeah, and a good way to have fun and just, you know, in a way kind of be social while you're writing. Yeah, who would have thought that was a thing? Yeah. Oh, very good. Well, thanks, Ray. I appreciate the question. That was great and perfectly timed. Um, all right. Next question for me. My son uh, loved A World Below and is really hoping for a sequel. Might I suggest calling it A World Below 2, A World Below, The World Below Electric Boogaloo? I think it's got a real nice snap to it. It's catchy. I'm gonna, uh, I would take a note, but this is being recorded already, so I can get back to this later and, and take that. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I love that. I, I actually, you probably do the same thing a little bit. You always leave books open for sequels in a sense. That's just smart because, you know, you're hoping um, that a sequel is wanted eventually, right? If you haven't sold a sequel in the first place. So uh, World Below certainly did leave with a bit of a, an opening there. Um, and I, I would love to return to it. I, as one of the things when we're writing, um, and a lot of people probably don't know this, but writers are sort of planning two years ahead. We're almost writing the books that are gonna keep coming out. So you write your first book and then you're like three books down the line before that one's even out. So it's sort of this, you have to revert back to that storyline again to dive back into the sequel. Yeah. Um, sometimes it happens, I, the next book I have coming out, Sarah in the Search for Normal, is a prequel to O.C. Daniel, which entirely arose because readers wanted to read about this story so they actually drove the process of bringing us towards this this book so you know that happens quite a bit and you, you get enough of that and that sort of directs where you want to put your energies next which is kind of cool oh, very cool yeah. yeah we have actually a couple more questions too from the chat so i'm going to jump in we're we're jumping yeah. around and we're all keeping you on your toes yeah it's it's not just your mom and dad anymore they have company now uh karen <laughs> karen upper our good friend wants to yeah. know was the hey karen was the story written in separate locations or written in the same room? I'm assuming, of course, we're talking about working with Kobe Bryant again. Yeah, so that, you know, Kobe sent me around sometimes. You know, I was in inner city Philadelphia. For Wizard Art Series, I spent a week in Chicago with the, one of the world's leading experts on isolation and human connectivity. She actually does both, Dr. Stephanie Cassiopo. Um, and she was amazing and brilliant. And she actually, she totally clockwork oranged me and put me in an MRI machine and flashed images in front of my face to like see what no was happening. Yeah. Was your eyelids propped open? Like Basically, I had like a mask that like, my whole face was in, I couldn't move my neck. Like I was getting totally clockwork orange. And we were doing, it was part of an ASMR study, which for those who don't know, is sort of that, that whisper sort of reading that, that tank gives you tingles. But there was just images flashing and she was, checking on my brain, we, we were doing all kinds of experiments throughout the University of Chicago. Everything we did for the Wizard Art Series is really grounded in science. Like there was actual psychologists and stuff who we would talk and clear things with. Um, I think Kobe was very cognizant that he had a big audience. He had maybe an audience of people who don't always read, but now we're going to read because Kobe Bryant was coming out with a book. So it was like, let's make sure we get this right. It was sort of a responsibility thing. Um, which made me feel better too, of course. 
Yeah. I love that. And I love hearing about that, the, the stuff you never would have otherwise known. That's fascinating to me. And the next question, too, is tied into this as well from uh, Kim HK asking, how did Kobe decide to collaborate with you? Did you read another one of your books and fall in love with your writing like the rest of us? It's a nice little compliment in the question, too. And love a P.S. You. you both are awesome. Thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate that. Well, that was a great question all around. Right? <laughs> I, 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 I could just read that one a few more times for the rest of the in interview the and call it that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was, um, yeah, you talk about sort of random moments in your life. But, it, yeah, Kobe had read some of my books. He got the Vindico first, which was my very first book, and read it in a day. He sat down one afternoon and it sort of just crushed this book and loved it. Uh, he ended That's up a big book, too. Yeah, and he, and he read all my books, and he watched some of my ludicrous YouTube videos I did in the early days when I thought that helped sell books. Probably not true, but you know that's what I was trying to do at the time. And he watched that and sort of got a kick out of them, and and yeah, and, and sort of called me up and told me he was a fan of my writing. And without thinking, I told him that I wasn't a fan of his uh, because I'm a Toronto Raptors fan, and, and therefore you cannot like Kobe Bryant. It was sort of this this always this villainous thing. And right. he got a kick out of that, and we had sort of an honest conversation about that. And, and then he just, like, flew down from there, and we, we got along from there. But, yeah, he was uh, a huge kid's author. And as I said, he was a big Potterhead. He, I was so jealous of this. In his office, he had a glass case with all the uh, signed Harry Potter books, original editions. And then he had another glass case with all the original edition Game of Thrones books signed. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I know. This, this was his two like <laughs> possessions in his office, and I wanted them so badly. <laughs> <laughs> At least you got to get close and just like put your hands near the case. Every I don't know. Maybe he didn't let you do that. Lifting the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to smell it. I just want yeah. to inhale the book for a moment. Just lift the case. <laughs> amazing. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. We are now up to nine likes. Five thumbs up, four hearts. So we've got your parents. I'm pretty sure Kim, Karen, and Ray, since they're here, and brothers. some mystery guests. <laughs> okay, two brothers, good. My wife might be watching this. Dance. No, she's probably not. But <laughs> we're, we're we're creeping up. This is this is going well. Uh, all right, here we go. Next question for me: Dragons versus drones versus Laura Monster Crusher versus OC Daniel versus the Incredible Space Rangers from Space. Who wins? Wow, um, that's a good question. Do you ever? I mean, sometimes you look, you almost forget you wrote certain books, and it's like, oh yeah, like, I love that book. <laughs> right. There's a lot of books. I've written a lot of books. <laughs> um, Laura Mont's Crusher, I think, because she just swings a giant hammer and crushes everything, and and I love her. Uh, so I, I think she beats all of them, um, especially Daniel, mostly Daniel. He has, he would just instantly bow out of that fight. He's got nothing. Yeah. I, I see. I love Daniel too. That was that's probably my favorite book of yours that I've read, and uh, and I didn't think he'd stand a chance either. Didn't think so, no. but uh, I, ha I had to put him in the mix. I had to I had to give him a shot. You know, I didn't want now, to just talk about you know, Albert, who was in that book and has her own book coming out. She would figure out a way to come out on top. I think she was the smart one. Daniel was the heartwarming kid, but Sarah was the smart one from the beginning. So. Fantastic. All right. Good to know. I like this. I like this. We've got a couple more people checking in. Lauren uh, Flattery says, I'm here. I don't know. Do you know Lauren by any chance? She's, uh, she was a teacher librarian in Durham region, did a lot with the OLA. So that's why I thought maybe your paths have crossed somewhere. So, she I'm actually works at the Pickering sure. Library with me now. I'm very much a face person, but I guarantee you, I'm sure our paths have crossed. Yeah. I probably have. Probably have. So she's here and Kim also uh, said that's what uh, Kim was thinking as well. I don't know if that was in response to Laura winning the fight. I think I think that's what Kim was going for there. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Well, I've got uh, I've got one more question for you, Wes. So again, we've had a lot of people chiming in through the chat. If anyone else has any more questions, feel free to post them. But my last question was: uh, You have actually a second book. You've mentioned it a couple now times now. A second book scheduled for publication during the pandemic. Sarah and the Search for Normal. Uh, that word, normal, sounds really kind of oddly familiar, but I can't really place it in this day and age. Can you remind me what it means and how it pertains to this, this book? Yeah, well, you're right. Talk about redefining all of our normal <laughs> as, a, as an everyday event. 
um, which fits in very nicely because, you know, as maybe all of us know, normal really doesn't make much sense. And, and I think that's part of the exploration of, of this book. And Sarah, the readers really connected with Sarah and O.C. Daniel in like a really overwhelming sense. Every letter I would get was like, tell me more about Sarah. Kind of, I like Daniel, but look, tell me more about Sarah. And so what they loved about her was this, this brimming confidence, this girl who had issues, but just had accepted them so, so fully that they no longer became issues. And that was what I loved about her too. So this book is, is pushing back to before that happened and how she got there. Um, sort of, again, connecting with a lot of issues, very serious issues, um, of mental health and stuff like that. But, but sort of her search for normal, and, and as we know, that's sort of a vain search. Uh, so more so her search for her own identity and how to become who she does become in OC Daniel. And so far, early readers are, are really, really loving it. So I'm, I'm excited to get it out in the world. It's been delayed. It was supposed to come out on May 5th. They pushed it back because of the pandemic. I think we're just going to try it out on June 5th and see what happens. So hopefully people will have a chance to order and read. That's great. That's fantastic. And I love that uh, that it came about from, uh, you know, readers' letters and, and requests, basically, to, to know more about her story, to go back and re- write a prequel to uh, Josie cool. Daniel. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Uh, we've got Shannon Howe Barnes from Canadian Children's Book Center saying, hi, Joel. Hi, Wesley. Hey, Shannon. Thanks for joining us. Ooh. Karen says she loves Sarah. Has Karen read uh, the new one yet? Or is she just referring to O.C. Daniel? I got I really know. jealous for a moment thinking, Karen, <laughs> did she get an early arc or something? Karen is like my early reader. Karen gets all books in advance. And uh, she's, she read season one in advance. She read Sarah in advance. She read other books in advance as well. I mean, she read Sarah... I think months ago now, I believe back in January, February, and uh, and I think she loved. She told me she loved it, so I, you know, I haven't, I haven't checked that. Maybe she wrote a scathing review on Good. No, actually, she wrote a nice review on Goodreads too. <laughs> so, uh, I think yeah. she she really loved it. Yeah. So no, Karen is is my is my early reader. She always gets an advanced copy as soon as they come in, sent off to Karen there. That is amazing. That's awesome. Got one more question from Ray. Uh, wants to know, what is your writing process? How do you, on any given day, sit down and just focus on writing? Yeah, and that's, you know, a key ingredient. I think a lot of us think we should wait for inspiration. Or we think that perhaps that, that com- it doesn't come for me often. I don't often get a thunderbolt moment that says I've got to sit down and write. You know, it's, it's very practical minded. It's, you know, sit down and, and a lot, a certain amount of time. Um, I'm very forward heavy, I guess. You know, I'll sit down and write a whole book and I won't read one line of it until I'm finished the whole thing because I'm so self-critical of my writing, which, which many of us may be. If I go back and read sentence one, I'll just keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. So I put out a draft and it's just generally crap. It's just, you know, unreadable dribble. <laughs> And, and I look and I'm like, okay, that's all right. Don't panic. And then you slowly and methodically begin to edit it and go over and over and over and get it into some sort of like crude shape that looks like it could be a statue, send it to the editor, she helps, and then down and down and down. And of course, even when an editor buys the book, it still has a ton of revision to go. So I always tell writers who aren't published yet and who think that people who are published are these geniuses who put out these immaculate first drafts. No, no, no. Uh, We're often writing crap initially, and (laughs) we're so persistent and stubborn that we then shape it into the books that that we try to us. So do not panic if you write a book and it doesn't, or write a story, it doesn't sound great at first. Um, You can work on that and keep working on that. I edit a ton. I edit much longer than I write. That's the only way it ever becomes readable. Yeah, for me, I uh, the first the first goal is just to get something down on paper and get to the end, and don't worry about how crappy it is, and uh, and then spend all the time polishing it up through editing and revisions at the end. Yeah, I mean, if you love editing, then writing becomes a much more joyous process. You know, a lot of people fear their editorial letters. I love them. You know, I, I love that. Yeah. Here's a hundred ways to make your book better, and ninety nine of them are probably right. <laughs> yeah. You know. Thank you. <laughs> one of them is like, just give it to a better author, you know, or something like that. But you, you put up that one and then you take the 99 and you shape it. And yeah, I love that process. And 
But I always, I get, that's one thing I always hear, and I'm sure you do too, is I wrote a story and it's, you know, it's crap. And now it's sitting on my computer, but it's like, that's okay. That's how it starts. You know, and now you start working on it. That's the next part of the process is to come now. Yeah, the editing for me is the exciting part. That's when you start to see and realize this is actually a book. Before it was just a bunch of random words in a string that didn't really make coherent sense. Now I could see this possibly being bound and on a bookshelf somewhere. Uh, exactly. We'll take one more uh, from the chat before we wrap up. Uh, Karen said, first of all, she read uh, the new book, Sarah and the Search for Normal, back in early March. March. And she wants to know if you write in a journal or use technology. Yeah, it's, it's entirely technology at this point. Um, it shouldn't be because now my writing has become so illegible, I could not possibly revert back to writing, which would be nice. I, I find when I write like a grocery list, it's like hieroglyphics. It's very difficult to read. It's, it's <laughs> awful. It's, so you know, please keep everyone keep writing out there. It's a terrible thing. Um, but yeah, I just generally, I'm always on my laptop now. Um, I have a lot of my ideas like just like lying in bed in the morning or something like that. And then I run down and jot things down as quick as I can and then decipher them from there. Or again, because I'm not afraid to write crap, I'll just write and whether it makes any sense at all. You just write and write and write and you know you can come back. So not really any need for a journal because you can just dive right in and pretend you're writing a great book and, you know, just delude yourself into thinking that. That's part of the key, I think. <laughs> That's brilliant. I love that. Well, listen, everybody, it's just about time uh, to, to close out this show. But as always, I've saved the absolute most important segment for the end. Since the beginning of quarantine, there's been little reason for any of us to wear shoes. We hardly leave our houses. So our socks are constantly on display and have taken center stage. Therefore, I think I'd like to uh, give our viewers a little uh, glimpse of our socks. I can go first. Okay. I have no shortage of funky, color, colorful socks. And uh, I try and often pick them if I can to match the guests. As I mentioned in the intro, you live in Nova Scotia. You do a lot of sailing. Mm. I wore my fanciest pair of fish socks. Ooh. Just for you, Wes. Nice. Representing the awesome. coast here in the fishing industry. They're, they're tropical fish. Those I don't think they're, they're native to Nova Scotian coast to the... But you never know. But still, for you, I wore invasive species, maybe. Yeah, but yeah, that, those are great. Yeah, could be that. Okay, I'm. Did you wear some funky socks for the show? So if you can see, you know, these oh, are, you guys, these are from Karen Upper, our our Karen Upper, as we spoke. It says reading You're your first reader. It says reading. It is your destiny. Uh, <laughs> well, are amazing. They're my favorite socks, of course. Karen sent them uh, a while back. And they're now my favorite socks. They're amazing, yeah. So when you said, you know, if you want to wear some cool socks, it was like, well, I always am. So that's easy. Yeah, absolutely. Karen actually has sent me and my entire family socks too. Uh, <laughs> last Halloween, she sent five pairs of Halloween and ghost socks, two adult pairs, one for me and one for my wife, and three child pairs for each of my kids. Amazing, amazing person. Karen, thank you so much. She's got time. She says, LOL about the socks. And uh, we've got a, she's got one more comment. I've got to get to it. Yeah, she it says, I wonder what, we can't leave Karen hanging here. I wonder what sort of story would happen if Laura Monster met Dr. Stockwell. Oh, that's one of the characters from Summer's End, my horror novel. We're doing a mashup, a crossover yeah. now. <laughs> Clever. You said you like writing with other, with other people, Wes. I think I've, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm smelling a hit is on her hands here. Thanks to Karen. She can yeah. read it first. Similar jackets on. I think there's a lot of symmetry here. Right? I'm wearing a Deadpool shirt. You're wearing Star Wars socks. I mean, it's all the same universe of geekdom. Let's just go with that. We'll have our agents <laughs> next. Exactly. <laughs> Kim loves the socks. Kim's saying amazing. And our good friend Meredith Touching is here as well from the Meredith. OLA. Those look like, yeah, those look like library marketplace socks from the OLA. Go check them out. A lovely plug for the OLA. Yeah, I definitely good. agree. <laughs> I'll support them <laughs> with any any way I can. So yes, go check out the OLA's library marketplace. Uh, Meredith, I've got uh, at least, no, probably five or six, maybe more socks at this point that I've bought at the OLA Super Conference over the years. So I've worn some on previous shows and I'm sure I'll wear some on future shows. 
Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and one last before we close out, Sandy is in now saying, I used to have a few jokes about pairs of matching socks, but I've lost one. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that is a oh, perfect way, God. perfect way to close out. Yeah. I love it. That We're is. up to uh, 23 likes now, Wes. So I think this might be wow. a record for anything I've ever posted online, other than that Simpsons video I did. Uh, yeah, that was... <laughs> give it time. It's give it time. <laughs> Exactly. We'll give it. We'll just keep talking until we get to the uh, million likes that I got for that That's silly crazy. little Simpsons video. All right. Well, like I said, those are some great socks, Wes. Thanks for sharing them. And this has been a great interview. It's the longest one, but it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate yeah. it. We had a lot of great questions from the chat. So thanks everybody for for watching and and participating. I uh, always want to say that you can buy any of Wesley's books uh, from an online. Uh, vendor or your favorite independent bookstore take a look most of them are shipping right now so that's the way i'd recommend going to make sure you get your hands on the wizard series and sarah's search for normal or any of his previous books as well thanks everybody for watching stay home wash your hands read canadian take care <laughs>